Good afternoon. As we continue on with our virtual meetings today, uh, we have another timely and important session, and we're very excited to have Danny Roderick to present the Galbraith Memorial Lecture. Uh, and I think this title uh, is, is truly fascinating given how many in our profession work on issues that involve significant trade uh, and international uh, exchange. And so we're really, Danny, we're really looking forward to this presentation. Let me just give a little bit of his background. Uh, he is the Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at the Harvard Kennedy School. It's published widely in the area of economic development, international economics, and political economy. His current research focuses on employment and economic growth, both in developing and advanced economies. He is the recipient of the inaugural uh, Albert O. Hirschman Prize for Social Science Research Council and of the Leontief Award for Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Thought. He is currently the, the president-elect of the International Economics Association and his newest book is entitled Straight Talk on Trade, Ideas for a Sane World Economy. He's the author of many other books on related topics. Uh, Danny, we apologize that we cannot present you with our award for being our Galbraith Memorial Lecturer in person, uh, but we want to recognize you for your con contribution and your willingness to present to us today. So I will uh, uh, stop with the introduction, but say to the audience that if you have questions for him, uh, I will be sitting here watching the question queue uh, and feed him questions at the end of the presentation. Danny, the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Keith, um, for the introduction. Um, thanks to the um, AANA for the um, for the invitation. It's it's, uh, it's great to be with you in a, in, in, a, in a manner of speaking. Um, we're all getting adjusted to this, uh, to doing these things virtually and 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 remotely. But um, uh, it's 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 a great honor to have been asked to do this and 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 to give the. Um, Goldbraith uh, Memorial Lecture uh, uh, this this year. Uh, as I was um, thinking about um, how to uh, present my talk, um, I, I became aware of um, uh, a, a, a letter that um, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith had uh, circulated uh, inside Harvard, um, which Erwin Collier um, uh, dragged out um, in his um, in his blog and and. Uh, uh, and, and I, it, it's a um, uh, it, it's a letter where he is uh, essentially back in 1972. He is um, uh, recommending to um, the president uh, of the university that the Department of Economics uh, should really be split into two, um, and 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 this of course reflected the ongoing debates in the economics. Uh, um, department at Harvard, but also sort of ongoing um, and perennial debates uh, in the economics discipline uh, between uh, those who um, were pursuing a more mainstream um, uh, work um, uh, of, um, of theory, methods, econometrics, um, and, um, and, and, and um, sort of an alternative uh, which Galbraith uh, uh, valued and, and, um, and, and, and thought that deserved its own department, which was much more uh, a kind of social economics and economics that was more practical and dealing with um, uh, policy problems. And, and in this little quote, in his inimitable style, um, uh, Galbraith is, is, is chiding um, his, his, his colleagues um, uh, and, and talking about how the division in economics um, uh, you know, covers not just the polemical folk tendencies of academic life, uh, learned delight in self-assertion, uh, um, our sensitivity to the intellectual shortcomings of others, uh, uh, but it also um, goes deeper um, into um, uh, uh, matters of acceptance or rejection of established economic institutions, acceptance or rejection of accustomed preconceptions of economic thought, the trade-off between precision, 
uh, uh, versus uh, sort of more innovative, critical, or, or what it called experimental uh, uh, work. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in some ways, I think uh, the subject that I'm going to be talking about, uh, the analysis of globalization, um, has, uh, has suffered from some of these divisions in, in, in the sense that uh, many of the things that perhaps should have been obvious to um, uh, eco economists at the outset about potential problems, about a potential backlash, about many of the distributional costs of the policies we're pursuing. Um, and, and, and that perhaps um, would have been um, a, a keen observer like Galbraith would have been much more perceptive on those that, than, than many mainstream economists were. Uh, I would say on the other side, however, um, that I think uh, there has been significant changes in the economics discipline since these lines were written by Goldraith in the early 1970s. Um, economics has become both more technical, but also more empirical and more applied. And I think uh, the fact that it's become more empirical um, has um, somehow acted a, a, a more as a shield um, against uh, what um, Goldraith here calls um, accustomed preconceptions of economic thought. And I think economics as a discipline um, has become uh, more open uh, uh, by virtue of uh, sort of being much more grounded in an empirical reality. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, empirical findings that um, I think is now uh, giving the economic analysis of globalization a, a much more nuanced and I think much more relevant um, uh, um, uh, 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 take. The, the, the the, my title is, um, uh, has globalization uh, failed us? And so the immediate question uh, that is raised is, uh, who is us? Um, in most directly, us might be the US. Uh, but I want to talk briefly also about two additional cases, two uh, developing countries, China and Mexico, which also um, uh, have experienced very different um, paths under um, the globalization experience of the last 30, 40 years. And I think the US, the US China and Mexico cover a gamut of experiences, which I think are, um, are uh, is, is, is quite um, telling uh, and, and teaches us a lot about the kind of globalization that we've had. Um, and then uh, roughly in the second half of my presentation, I wanna uh, maybe turn a little bit more normative and prescriptive uh, and talk about um, how in fact we can envisage different types of globalization and some of them uh, might be better than others and, and, and open up a menu um, of uh, different types of globalizations. And, and so we can make more informed choices uh, as, as, as we go um, um, uh, forward uh, with the idea that, that really globalization is not just sort of one uni unidirectional uh, kind of a thing that either we're moving more to, in the direction of more globalization or less globalization. In fact, there are many dimensions uh, along which we can make, make some choices. But let me start um, uh, with the United States and um, a, a particular study that, of course, um, I'm sure everybody is, is import penetration. Um, and here, uh, this map uh, shows where the, the worst hit areas were uh, with the dark uh, red color. Um, it was clear that, that, that many parts of the country um, were, did not, um, let alone benefit, were, were actually adversely affected in terms of losses of jobs, uh, which uh, were not, um, um, uh, did not really come back um, for uh, more than uh, a decade or so. Uh, the author uh, Dorn and Hansen study is, is, is um, relatively uh, well known. Um, another study that, that I like, which um, is uh, somewhat less well known, um, actually refers to the experience with, uh, with NAFTA, uh, not the China trade shock. Um, and this um, study in a somewhat similar fashion looked at uh, different communities in the United States um, that were competing directly uh, with uh, imports from Mexico. And when the tariffs were zeroed, as a result of um, uh, um, the NAFTA in the mid-1990s, uh, 
uh, that that those communities that were particularly badly hit were those that were directly sort of head on in competition uh, with uh, with Mexican uh, exports. And as this little uh, passage says, uh, it wasn't that uh, these tariff reductions um, uh, were associated with substantial reductions in blue collar wages of workers that were wor working in those plants. Uh, but it's also in the same uh, localities, in the same communities, workers working in service industries uh, also um, uh, suffered um, uh, somewhat significant declines uh, in, in, in incomes as well. So these uh, distributional effects are largely um, along sort of regional lines of, of communities, regions that were directly competing with Chinese or Mexican uh, imports um, uh, were uh, uh, certainly um, uh, were uh, by those who felt uh, these impacts were uh, uh, were, were sizable. Um, it's interesting to to uh, compare these distributional effects uh, with what um, the aggregate effects or the net um, efficiency benefits of uh, um, these uh, trade shocks. Um, a, a, a particularly uh, detailed and, and well done quantitative uh, study of NAFTA's uh, efficiency uh, effects in the United States uh, finds that even though it had the uh, NAFTA had significant effect, effects on the volume of trade uh, in the United States, uh, it had actually tiny, tiny effects on aggregate uh, real income. Uh, so the number uh, that's highlighted on this table is 0.04% increase uh, in, um, in, in, in welfare for uh, the United States as the efficiency benefit from NAFTA. That's not 4%, it's 0.04%. Um, and, uh, you know, from the perspective that, that you know, Mexico overall uh, is, is, is a relatively uh, small country with respect to the United States, maybe it's not, um, uh, it's not um, very surprising, but uh, what really stands out here is the magnitude of the distributional effects relative to the efficiency gains. And it's one question uh, that I'll come back to um, in, in a second. Um, now, uh, these, uh, these sort of empirical results, the distributional and overall uh, economic efficiency gains uh, of uh, two of the biggest uh, trade shocks that hit the United States, uh, the last uh, few decades, NAFTA and China's entry into WTO, um, they're not really surprising from the standpoint of economic theory uh, because the standard economic theory says, and I'll, I'll summarize this under three headings. Uh, first, that uh, reducing barriers at the border generally enlarges the overall economic pie. Um, uh, there are some caveats, of course, that I'm not going to get into with regard to market uh, failures. Um, secondly, um, uh, the implication that, that not everyone is going to win, that there are going to be um, uh, some important distributional effects, uh, but that we need to really focus on the relevant margins where those distributional effects likely uh, to happen. And I think what happened uh, with things like um, uh, the WTO or NAFTA was that initially we were looking at uh, the wrong places, looking at capital versus labor, skill versus unskilled labor. Um, and while there were some effects there, they were not nearly as large as when we looked at the regional margin, that, that uh, labor turns out is not as uh, mobile as we thought, and that many of these distributional effects were, uh, were, were played out on a spatial uh, reg regional uh, scale rather than on, 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 on factor or an occupational uh, kind of, of, of margins. The third and probably um, the least um, recognized aspect of economic theory with respect to opening up to trade uh, is that as the trade barriers get smaller and smaller, that is to say, as we're moving uh, deeper and deeper into globalization, uh, redistribution tends to loom much larger uh, compared to the magnitude of the efficiency gains. And that's an important point. That, um, and I, I, I want to uh, um, elaborate on this a little bit, partly because it's not very well understood. Uh, but first, with respect to, of course, uh, just the distribution, um, uh, we have famous th uh, theorem of Stolper and Samuelson uh, that says that um, in a very, very limited model, two by two model, full intersectoral mobility of factors, 
uh, that we have a very stark result that when we liberalize the trade, that one of the two factors is made absolutely worse off. The real income of one of the two factors uh, declines. Uh, now, this is a very, very special model, uh, but actually the, the, the logic of absolute losses or very stark distributional effects from opening up the trade is much more general uh, than the Stolper-Samuelson uh, framework. Um, and I'll give you one generalization here, uh, which is that as long as an importable good continues to be produced at home, that is, as long as we rule out complete specialization, there's always going to be at least one factor of production that is rendered worse off by the liberalization of trade. There will be at least one group that is going to be rendered worse off. It will suffer real income losses in absolute terms uh, as a consequence of the liberalization of trade. From a technical standpoint, this occurs because factor price changes uh, must bracket goods price changes. So there's always going to be some owners of factors uh, that are at the losing end of these changes in relative prices that are induced um, uh, from, from trade liberalization. So this notion that stark redistribution is the, uh, is the uh, other side of the coin from the net efficiency gains uh, is a very robust um, result uh, of, of, of economic uh, theory. How much redistribution uh, should we get? Um, and here is where I want to come to this point about um, the magnitude of redistribution becoming very large relative to the efficiency gains uh, when we are uh, at advanced stages of globalization. So let me heuristically introduce a, a concept um, that I've uh, called some years ago, the political cost benefit ratio of trade liberalization, PCBR. Uh, so this is really a very sort of um, a, a, a heuristic notion that just um, divides the total redistribution uh, by the efficiency gains that are generated by the removal of trade barriers. And the notion is that if you think redistribution is costly, efficiency gains are benefits, uh, the ratio of the absolute value of redistribution to the net gains uh, is a measure of, you know, basically, uh, you know, we may not want to think about necessarily as a political cost because maybe we're uh, redistributing income to politically favored groups. But another way of, th of stating is just that the, it's the amount of redistribution that takes place per dollar of efficiency gains that generated by the removal of trade barriers. Now, um, the, the analytical point here uh, which is um, general, is that this ratio of redistribution to efficiency gains um, progressively rises as trade liberalization tackles lower and lower barriers. So that's what I mean by the redistributive cost of liberalization getting to be larger and larger as we go deeper and deeper into globalization. As the barriers get lower, uh, we distribute more per dollar of efficiency gain. What is the intuition for this? Uh, well, um, uh, first, it's really the intuition is really driven by what's happening in the denominator uh, of this ratio, uh, the efficiency gains, because import tariffs are just like a tax, and their efficiency costs rise with the square of the tax rate, which means that for high taxes we have disproportionately large gains from liberalizing, but for low taxes we have disproportionately lower gains. So the denominator is highly nonlinear. Uh, the numerator, however, which is the amount of redistribution that we get, depends purely on relative price changes. So that is approximately linear. Uh, so that we have a numerator that's linear, uh, a denominator that becomes smaller and smaller at the margin uh, as the barrier trade barriers get smaller. Um, and therefore, as a result, uh, we have that this ratio of redistribution to efficiency gains become smaller and, uh, I'm sorry, larger and larger um, as uh, globalization advances, which I think is one way of understanding why politically it becomes more divisive. Uh, so I've answered the question of how much redistribution uh, um, analytically, but it's also interesting to sort of do just some basic um, sort of quantitative simulation. So here's you know, two very simple simulations, one is just uh, just a, um, a, a partial equilibrium uh, supply and demand framework. 
And then the second one on the right hand side is a general equilibrium two by two example. Um, and uh, what, what I've circled here is basically this PCBR ratio or the redistribution per dollar of net gain. And you can see that those go from maybe a multiple of five when tariff rates are 40% uh, to multiples of 20 or more uh, when the tariffs rates start falling uh, below 10%. So if you look at um, sort of the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the right-hand side panel, when the initial tariffs are at the level of about 5%, at the margin, liberalizing those tariffs are going to redistribute uh, roughly $45 per dollar of efficiency gain that's being generated, which is of course huge, but that's just in the logic uh, of, uh, of, of, of the model, which is that we're really um, you know, chasing after smaller and smaller efficiency gains and the redistributive effects are becoming larger. Now, the, the question that might immediately be raised is, you know, Maybe you know, sort of the problem wasn't with the economics. The problem is just with the policymakers that simply did not compensate the losers. But uh, the point about this, uh, you know, sort of looking closely about how much redistribution actually takes place um, through the logic of uh, the gains from trade, uh, also makes it clear uh, that the economics of compensation becomes more and more difficult uh, because if you have this. A ratio of distribution to efficiency gain something of the order of, of 10, uh, then even if the excess burden of taxation is as low as 10 cents on the dollar, because you need to tax somebody to redistribute it to the groups you want to compensate, then even if the excess burden of taxation is as low as 10 cents on the dollar, then essentially the gains from trade, the gains from trade are going to be more than exhausted. Uh, if you want to compensate the losers uh, when uh, you're liberalizing trade barriers that are already at the level of 5%, uh, if not lower. It's even worse when we take into account that this is a period also when uh, capital has become uh, interna internationally more mobile, um, and that means that the burden of redistributive taxation has to fall on workers, and we see it in a declining uh, uh, corporate tax um, rates, uh, uh, we see it with sort of the, the tax burden being felt more and more on, on the immobile uh, factor and labor. So in some sense, compensation also becomes somewhat self-defeating. There's also a, a political logic to why compensation um, in, uh, in, in practice has not um, uh, worked very well. Um, and that's because uh, there is a kind of a, a political dynamic inconsistency attached to the American way of, of uh, trying to compensate the losers through uh, trade adjustment assistance, uh, which is to say that, you know, you buy the losers by promising them uh, compensation and the TAA, uh, but these promises are essentially time inconsistent because once the uh, trade agreement is signed, uh, um, and uh, it's costly to, um, to revoke the agreements, uh, then, uh, then the uh, political incentive to fund uh, those commitments uh, is going to be very, very weak um, after the fact. Um, and, and that's not a very bad description of, in fact, how uh, TAA um, has worked um, in, in the United States. There is another um, aspect about um, the the kinds of trade agreements that we've had since the 1990s that I want to briefly mention. Uh, uh, and this goes beyond uh, the reduction of trade barriers at the border. Uh, we've also moved into a kind of a world uh, where uh, trade agreements have begun to encompass all kinds of regulations and policies uh, that exist behind the border. Um, rules on subsidies, of course, agriculture, on services, on industrial policy, intellectual property rights, uh, uh, sort of these bilateral investment agreements and trade agreements that, um, that contain investor um, uh, uh, dispute settlement, uh, capital flow measures uh, have been introduced into regional and bilateral trade agreements and so forth. So this is a much more a kind of a, a deep integration model uh, that has uh, increase um, the constraints on the use of economic policy uh, in ways that didn't exist. And 
what that also means is that the political tensions that arise with the kinds of uh, trade agreements that we have signed have gone beyond simply these redistributive aspects, uh, but also now entail increasingly sort of issues about, you know, values. You know, who should decide what domestic uh, investment policies or intellectual property rights or industrial policies uh, rules with respect to agriculture and service or to be? Is it some trade agreement or should, be, should that be left uh, much more to domestic policy autonomy? And in general, when trade agreements are trying to harmonize different regulatory regimes, uh, we also have lost now uh, the presumption that they're going to be necessarily uh, uh, efficiency enhancing, uh, because whatever increase in, uh, whatever, whatever gains from trade we get from regulatory harmonization, we have to consider on the other side of the border that we're losing that regulatory autonomy and therefore regulatory diversity. Um, and there are some costs to those regulatory diverse uh, to, to um, forsaking that regulatory diversity if different nations have different preferences precisely for those standards and, and, and regulations. Um, so, but this is all in some sense a kind of a, a, a you know an advanced world kind of a, a presentation of uh, where some where we have I think um, have have made some uh, they've taken some wrong steps. It's it's really a story about. United States with regard to distribution. It's really about Europe with respect to these uh, deeper integration agreements. But what about the developing countries? What about the argument that it's been sort of globalization has also enabled in this period um, hundreds of millions of people to lift themselves uh, up from, from poverty so that if us, what do we mean by us, is not the advanced countries, but it's the poor nations, then in fact the record uh, the record of globalization is, is much stronger. Now, to some extent, that's ob obviously true with you know, the, the, the most important case, of course, China, uh, which has managed to um, uh, uh, leverage uh, globalization after the 1990s into the uh, most significant uh, poverty uh, reduction experience ever uh, in, in history. And that's just uh, an unbelievable uh, experience. Um, and we cannot deny that um, globalization has enabled China, has, has played a role in this. But I think the important footnote I want to, to place on this uh, is that China has been so successful playing the globalization uh, game precisely because it has played it by different rules than the rules that we've expected other countries to play it by after the 1990s. Um, so uh, basically, um, you know, unlike the post 1990s expectation that countries would essentially become market economies with more or less sort of predominantly private ownership, would sharply reduce their trade barriers, would have liberal investment regimes, uh, would harmonize their intellectual property rights regimes, would, would enable free mobility of capital and their currencies to float. In all those dimensions, of course, China. Um, uh, essentially uh, violated uh, the rule book. Um, and part of the reason why the tensions with China have risen uh, to um, the level that they have is precisely because China has violated these expectations on subsidies, trade barriers, intellectual property rights, intellectual property um, uh, on, on investment rules, state, uh, state ownership uh, and management of its exchange rate and, and capital flows and so forth. Um, that even if they do not violate any particular WTO rule, uh, they certainly violate the norms of the post-1990 understanding of what the rules for globalization was. So one uh, Chinese policymaker uh, once described to me um, how uh, China managed globalization by saying, you know, it's like China opened up the window uh, to the world economy, but also placed a mosquito net. Um, so that you know you get all the fresh air from the world economy, but the mosquito net uh, prevented all the sort of harmful elements uh, from uh, from from coming in. It was a very kind of a mixed uh, kind of a policy that was much more in line with, um, if you will, like a kind of an earlier uh, conception of globalization, a much shallower model of globalization in terms of some domestic economic policies that had some. Uh, parallels with the Bretton Woods era, pre-1990s understanding of uh, how to do globalization, and I'll come back to it uh, in, in, a, in a second. 
if you want to find, if you want to look for a European country that actually played by those rules of the post 1990s ideal, so the, you know, the, the post 1990 ideal that's sort of uh, summarized in this slide, uh, you can't, you know, sort of, um, you know, you can't do worse uh, than, you can't do better uh, than, than Mexico. Uh, essentially, Mexico made uh, unilateral and sort of, you know, signing of trade agreements, NAFTA, unilateral reduction of trade barriers, uh, free flow of capital management, yeah, sort of, uh, uh, all of that, it's the centerpiece of its economic development. Uh, sort of opening up to the world economy became Mexico's development strategy uh, after the um, late 80s. Um, and it's, it's, it's um, and if you look at, um, uh, you know, sort of indicators of, um, indicators of foreign trade and foreign investment, which is on the uh, right-hand side of this slide, um, you can see a definite sort of uh, doubling or tripling of uh, exports and FDI shares in GDP after NAFTA. So, uh, so in terms of foreign trade and foreign direct investment, it's certainly um, a NAFTA and all its own trade reforms at the same time uh, did work. If you look at where it really matters in terms of uh, per capita income and overall productivity, uh, it did not work at all. Um, in fact, um, uh, uh, China, I'm sorry, Mexico's uh, per capita income level essentially uh, stagnated vis-a-vis uh, um, -vis the, um, uh, the, 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 the United States um, and, uh, and, and overall productivity growth uh, in Mexico after the 1990s was abysmal uh, compared to the period, let's say 1915 to 1980, when it was a much more protected uh, economy. Now, why has this happened in, in, in Mexico? Uh, it has happened because largely globalization has aggravated um, Mexico's productive dualism. Uh, as you know, the north of the economy, Mexico did rather well. Um, the south um, and much of the central parts did not do very well. We see this in a kind of productive decoupling uh, in the economy between the best performing firms, uh, the best performing industries, uh, the best performing regions, and the rest. And this decoupling is not such a bad thing uh, if uh, the part that is productively more advanced absorbs the rest of the economy. So resources are moving from the less productive to the more productive, but in the Mexican economy that has not been happening. Uh, the most productive pockets uh, in the north and in particular industries in Mexico have remained small and they've actually in terms of their employment share they've shrunk relative to the rest of the economy which is why the aggregate uh, is doing uh, is doing so is doing so poorly. Um, so if we were to sort of sum up um, the income effects of um, you know so this, you know it's not just globalization of course that's captured in this picture uh, which is, you know, the, the famous um, uh, elephant uh, curve that uh, Brian Komilanovic uh, first uh, drew. Um, and what we see is that that basically this is the post-1990 period has been extremely good uh, for the, the, the wealthiest in the world, the top 1% that captured uh, more than a quarter of total economic growth during this period. Um, much of the uh, sort of the, the, the bottom 90% uh, in the US and Western Europe didn't do as well. So th those, that's the middle part of this distribution that, that got squeezed. Uh, then a number of large uh, developing countries, uh, emerging countries, China, of course, but also after the 1980s, India as well, uh, you know, did relatively well, again, off the back of very mixed, very heterodox policies. And that's sort of the bump towards the bottom, the, the emerging. And there's, a, you know, the, the poorest countries, once again, uh, didn't do all that well. So it's a very, very heterogeneous, very mixed uh, picture uh, that, um, that I think, you know, we should not be surprised um, in light of um, sort of the theoretical exp expectations that uh, we ought to have had uh, coming um, to uh, the kinds of policies that were uh, pursued uh, in uh, in these economies, um, I'm I'm since you know I'm 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 running out of time. I I, I just want to say uh, maybe spend maybe uh, um, five uh, minutes or so uh, 
talking a little bit more prescriptively uh, about um, sort of how can we broaden our vision, uh, what I call the sort of designing uh, a globalization regime. And we and and this is so. This is a question that's really beyond simply you know moving forward or backwards on this sort of you know just a, a single dimension. There are several questions we need to answer. Uh, we need to answer which policies should we prioritize in terms of liberalizing, which flows, and how much? Uh, because as I was telling you earlier, sort of the, you know, where we are in globalization also matters in terms of you know, the prospective gains uh, uh, um, uh, relative to the redistributive effects. Um, how much should we reach behind the borders? Uh, how much should we constrain domestic policy? Um, and how should the rules be governed? Uh, you know, what's, what's the role of international institutions versus uh, norms of reciprocity um, uh, um, and, and self-help uh, in, in enforcing rules? Um, and, 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 and in history, I think, you know, we've had at least three different models of globalization uh, that have provided somewhat different mix of answers uh, to these. So for example, if you go back uh, to the gold standard, let's say between sort of the 1880 and uh, 1914, um, the gold standard was uh, similar to today's uh, post 1990s uh, globalization model insofar as it too aspired to free capital mobility. It too aspired to free trade in goods. It was similar to today's globalization in that its rules also reached behind uh, borders in the sense that global, the gold standard rules uh, um, uh, essentially constrain what kinds of, what today we would call macroeconomic policies, monetary and fiscal policies countries should pursue because the requirement of maintaining a fixed peg uh, to the gold and the requirement that you should have completely free capital mobility meant that you know, your ability to conduct an independent monetary policy was essentially very limited. Um, but it was different uh, from today's globalization in that uh, it also aspired for much of this period to labor mobility. Um, and the rules of the gold standard were, were not enforced through international agreements, uh, as has been the case after the 1990s, but much more through self-enforcing or self-help kind of norms that if a country did not pay its debts under the gold standard, it would be uh, you know, British or American uh, warships that would show up uh, in, 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 in the port, in the harbor, uh, to ensure that international debt contracts were being enforced. Now, the Bretton Woods period, uh, uh, roughly between the end of the Second World War and into the 1980s, I would say, uh, really was a much shallower model of globalization that really aspired to free trade in goods and, and, and in a very narrow, narrow range of such goods, really just manufacturing. Uh, but in many ways actually was very successful if you look at measures of growth in incomes, productivity, even trade and, and foreign investment. Um, so obviously we should aim to have uh, to grow the size of the pie, but we should also care about how the pie is distributed. And we should care about political accountability. That is the degree to which rules uh, of uh, the global economy are uh, accountable and respond uh, to different preferences and needs in different countries. And so far as poor countries and rich countries might have different uh, needs in terms of economic policies, or might have uh, different views with respect to health regulations or services and so forth. And here the tensions are one uh, is you know, what I would call a kind of an Adam Smith versus Friedrich List kind of attention, reaping the gains from trade by uh, uh, bringing the barriers down versus reaping the gains from productive diver diversification by ensuring that you're stimulating or at least protecting some of your uh, uh, manufacturing or your productive base. Um, there is a, a, a tension that arises from how the pie is going to be distributed, which my earlier discussion of the stolper samuelson theorem and its extensions uh, alluded to. Uh, so we want to make sure we pay attention to these distributive costs, uh, and we want to be clear that we're making the right trade-off uh, between the gains from trade versus the gains from regulatory uh, diversity. 
um, and, and, and those are sort of where uh, the, 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 the tensions that, that we need to manage. Now, um, uh, the standard economics of trade um, tells us that um, for the most part in international economics, virtue should be its own reward. That is that if you're taking care of your own economy and society, freer trade is generally going to expand national welfare. Of course, subject to this you know, being able to redistribute domestically. The key point here is that there isn't a huge amount of conflict uh, between what countries, well-governed countries, left to their own would do and what an open world economy requires. That is to say that in general, there should be a strong presumption that well-governed countries will choose nearly globally optimal policies. And the two categories of major exceptions there are policies that would be called beggar thy neighbor policy, like an optimum tariff policy, or policies with respect to maintaining global public goods, which today, of course, uh, you know, global uh, sort of issues about uh, public, global public health, or of course, global climate change would fit under there. Um, so I think, you know, the, the kind of globalization we should want, uh, you know, would try to produce benefits uh, to all rather than to few, uh, would try to definitely have rules, but rules that are focused on disciplining uh, beggar thy uh, neighbor policies and enforcing rules for global public goods per se. So those are the two areas where we actually need strong global rules, but otherwise would tend to be uh, rather permissive. That is that they would leave space for policy autonomy and institutional diversity. So this is, I co come back to this matrix and ask what might that imply? Um, so I think, um, you know, it, what it implies uh, in the context of, of the international trade regime. It implies a kind of a world where, um, with respect to what is currently the most contentious trade relationship, the US versus China relationship, uh, it implies a much more um, a, a peaceful coexistence type of a regime where uh, the United States understands that China has very different economic regime, has very different economic institutions, um, and that, uh, that th those institutions aren't going to go away. Um, and therefore, the US doesn't really um, gain anything um, by trying to fit China into some kind of a mold um, of what it thinks a, a sort of a market oriented economy should be like. I think, by the same token, I think China needs to understand uh, that there are genuine concerns in the United States with respect to. Uh, protecting the integrity of domestic innovation systems, protecting labor and social standards in the US and Europe, uh, you know, concerns about human rights in China that will often imply that the United States might have to, or Europe might have to put restrictions on certain kinds of trade, certain kinds of investment flows. Uh, investment flows. Um, but I think, so this is in some sense a return, would be a kind of a return uh, to the uh, spirit uh, if, but not the exact policies, the spirit of the Bretton Woods era, uh, where I, I think there was a much greater room for countries to devise their own institutions and to, to uphold their own sort of social standards um, and, 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 and economic strategies. Um, and I think given the degree of difference uh, that exists in this world between the US and, and, and China, I think that's really, uh, um, I think that's really the only way we can, can move forward. Uh, moving much more in the direction of back towards um, sort of more permissive, a somewhat shallower integration. I think the one area where um, uh, the economic gains are indisputably still very, very large is the one area uh, where the barriers, of course, are very high, and that's uh, in the area of labor mobility. Um, it's not politically um, very easy to make progress there with respect to uh, liberalizing international uh, labor uh, mobility, but I would say that if if you know, there is a there, there is still a frontier of globalization, uh, where the gains and the net gains are still very large relative to distributive effects, uh, it would be the area of labor mobility precisely because you know the barriers are so high and the earlier logic I presented, which is that the redistribution to efficiency tends to be relatively low and the barriers are very high. That argument applies now in the reverse 
uh, to, um, to, the, to the labor mobility case. So um, let me uh, just end uh, by, by saying that, um, uh, that, 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 that rather than thinking that, you know, that this globalization backlash, the difficulty that we find ourselves in will necessarily uh, you know, sort of you know, undermine globalization per se, and that will necessarily make us all worse off as a result that we really need to think about globalization as a kind of a very multi-dimensional uh, set of rules and that it's, it's, it's possible to uh, uphold a certain kind of globalization that would be in fact uh, um, you know, ultimately healthier and more sustainable and would allow different countries uh, to pursue their own domestic um, uh, economic strategies, rebuild their domestic social contracts as certainly uh, countries in, 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 in the United, United States and Europe absolutely need to do. Um, and, and, and that's possible to do uh, without a complete uh, downfall of globalization and without having to reap uh, the, gain, the gains from trade. Um, so uh, I, I apologize for having had to uh, uh, sort of rush through um, the last few slides uh, very, very quickly but I hope I was able to communicate the gist, the gist of my message. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. I'm happy to take a few uh, comments or, or, or questions um, if, if there are any. Thank you, thank you, Danny, so much. Yes, we've got some questions in here. Uh, and, and one that I was actually thinking of, but someone else has asked it. What, are you concerned about the breakdown of the WTO settlement system? Uh, and has it put us into a world that get like where powerful countries have veto power over reform? Yeah, so my, my take on the WTO is that uh, it had, you know, compared to the previous regime, it had one very strong positive and it had a bunch of negatives. Um, I think um, the, the negatives were that the WTO reached into a whole lot of new areas uh, where um, the overall economic gains from trade were going to be small compared to the political difficulties and economic difficulties uh, that those agreements created. So I'm talking about um, you know everything from you know intellectual property rights, the um, the um, 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 the sanitary and, and, and phytosanitary rules to um, to, to, to subsidies. Um, uh, to um, you know the services and agricultural areas, which have become uh, which has been problematic for a number of both middle-income countries and, and, and Europe as well. So I think this expansion into the new areas behind the borders, sort of the new frontier for liberalization. I think the the, the cost-benefit balance in terms of the economic gains, the political costs that would be borne domestically. Um, I, I think you know that decision, you know, reflected a kind of a 1990s hyperglobalism. You know that you know this that globalization is just an you know a, a kind of it was irreversible, and you need to keep pushing at it in that direction. And I think so that that was I think the expansion of the agenda was negative. Um, the the where I think the WTO made a significant stride forward is, I think, in its dispute settlement, which is, is, a, is a really, you know, the only um, international dispute settlement process that actually manages to get a country like the United States to change its policy. I mean, that's saying something. The United States have actually, in some cases, changed its policies because of some international tribunal, which really hasn't happened as far as anywhere else, except for in, this, in the area of trade. So the new Dispute settlement process is very good, uh, and um, but I, you know I would have much rather seen it apply to sort of you know border barriers and narrower ranges. So have a very good. In other words, my ideal WTO would be much narrower in scope, uh, with the so sort of the gap with the dispute settlement process of the WTO, if you will. Now, uh, having said this, uh, so. Uh, and I think part of the, the backlash and the current difficulty that the WTO finds itself in is, is, is a result of this of this overreach. Um, and I, I, you know, I think the questioner is, is I mean, the question is is, is is absolutely right that the benefit of the WTO is because it's a multilateral arrangement 
um, and therefore gives some power to small countries where they may not have had it. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's why such an you know, international organization is, 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 is great. So my hope would be to continue having an international trade organization uh, that is, uh, that in terms of you know, what I said in my last slide is really engaged much more in, the, in sort of in negotiating exchange of policy space among countries rather than exchanging market access necessarily uh, where the economic gains aren't very, very large. So um, that's my take on the WTO. Uh, another question concerns, if one is, one is focused on the welfare of the very poorest of laborers in various societies, what kind of remedies might you suggest uh, to help those groups? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure um, what, what, what's, which societies um, the questioner had in mind, but in general, um, the groups that have been most hurt by trade uh, um, in Europe or in, in the United States have not been the, the poorest. Uh, they have been people who um, were in the sort of you know, lower middle class or even middle class. They had sort of people who had production jobs in manufacturing. Um, and, and sort of and 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 you know and, and these weren't the you know let's be clear these weren't the poorest people uh, in uh, in the United States or in other uh, countries that were adversely affected by uh, trade with, with with China and other uh, um, emerging uh, countries but you know that's not that's not a reason why we shouldn't care I mean I think you know in these countries we've had an experience of a, a middle class that's being squeezed. You know, different parts of you know sort of the country, you know regions, uh, communities that were very adversely affected, where jobs disappeared, where factories closed down, and ended up suffering um, you know significant social damage, not just sort of economic losses, uh, but increasing crime, breakdown in family, um, increased death rates, which you know the, the book by Anne Case and Angus Deaton. Uh, on, on deaths um, uh, of despair um, really sort of describes in, in harrowing detail. Um, so this, this squeeze in the middle um, have had, has had a huge uh, social cost. So I want to make, make clear that, so this isn't necessarily the poorest people. Um, uh, and I think uh, that's why, I mean, I think the best way to help these people uh, is going to be by uh, sort of by generating sort of good jobs, by finding good jobs in these communities. And I think that's a, a you know, sort of a, a very important agenda. And we don't know exactly what to do. There's now lots of interesting work being done on space-based um, uh, sort of um, uh, policies um, uh, of, of you know, regional development policies to revive um, new businesses. Unfortunately, I don't think many of these jobs are going to be in manufacturing. They'll have to be in services and other areas. Uh, but that's really where, where, I need to, where we need to focus. I think the poorest, um, I think, you know, their, uh, I think investments in, in, in education, in training, connecting them with, with markets and employment opportunities, and of course, safety nets um, uh, and transfers and support for families. And those are, you know, very important parts of, of the safety net. That, that, that you know, countries need. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to tell you that we've had a number of comments in the chat box thanking you for a, a wonderful presentation. But here's another question to you, specific about Latin America and, and how, how would your prescriptions apply to Latin America as developing countries? Well, you know, uh, Latin America experienced, I mean, I think the, the, the Mexican case that I briefly talked about is, is, is a kind of, um, uh, you know, in, in, in one, in, in some ways or other, I think most uh, sort of middle income Latin American countries have experienced a version of this, which is a kind of a, a, a process of uh, deindustrialization. Um, and um, you know, sort of a, a kind of disappearance, um, weakening of uh, the good jobs uh, in, in these economies. Now, unlike in the United States, 
um, and we were talking about the very poor in in uh, in, the, in 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 the previous question. Uh, but unlike in the United States and many countries in Europe, uh, actually um, Latin American countries did much better addressing the needs of the very poor. In fact, starting with Mexico in the 1980s, um, uh, which began to experiment with conditional cash transfer programs, uh, Latin American countries started in significantly ramped up uh, transfers to the very poor, uh, increased in, in, you know, education, investments in education and health. And, and this really showed up uh, in improved um, social indicators and, and in fact declining inequality because the bottom was coming up. So Latin America, including Mexico, uh, during much of this period in terms of overall inequality um, uh, did better because, I mean, in terms of, I mean, they started being very unequal, but inequality declined until recently in many Latin American countries uh, because of much better uh, social policies and social protection. Uh, but where, you know, where we didn't get the, the gains are in terms of generating productive economic opportunities for the bulk of the labor force in particular in the middle. Um, and, and so the, the, you know, the rich did very well. Uh, the poor, you know, sort of were brought up through um, these transfer policies and social protection schemes and investment in education. Uh, but the, the productive middle of these economies uh, bas basically just collapse. And, and so that's, again, is the area where we need to come up with new kinds of policies to think about how, you know, sort of these economies um, can generate, uh, you know, sort of productive jobs for the middle of the um, income distribution, for the middle of the, 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 the labor uh, force that they have. And, and that's, this is not a universal problem that I think all countries are facing, uh, given the you know, sort of technological change, uh, the industrialization, uh, the kind of pressures from globalization, uh, was all aggravated, of course, by uh, by the current um, health situation. And, and I'm going to try to slide one more question in here before we run out of time. But uh, I've got a question here about: Do you think environmental labor slash labor provisions and trade agreements could cause? increased income inequality uh, between countries? Well, I mean, I, so one question is whether if countries, if, let's say countries were engaging in trade policies uh, that occasionally kept imports from lower cost countries out in order to pursue uh, domestic, in order to ensure that domestic labor standards and domestic distributive goals were met, would this impose a very significant cost on low-income countries? My answer would be largely no. Um, I think, and the evidence I would draw on uh, to support my answer would be to say that, I mean, if you go back to the 1960s, you know, 1970s, 1980s, uh, before the WTO, when trade restrictions were still relatively high and countries had significant autonomy uh, to protect uh, domestic sectors that were being adversely affected by trade from developing countries. Uh, you know, that was a period when you had countries like, you know, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, um, you, know, uh, you know, Malaysia later on, Indonesia were doing very, very well through trade and, and being able to export using sort of you know their uh, you know, exports as a way of of, of 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 developing their economy, even though advanced countries had significant uh, um, uh, space in which to impose trade restrictions, as in fact they did through the multi-fiber arrangement and through various voluntary export restraints and so forth that they applied in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so. I think the, the basic constraint here is not for developing countries, is not what the advanced countries are doing with their trade policy. The basic constraint is the ability of developing countries to get their growth strategy right. And I don't think um, uh, that the if the advanced countries were to engage occasionally in what we derisively would call protectionism, that would be necessarily a very um, um, a big handicap. I would say the same about environmental goals. I mean, I would say if if advanced countries seriously engage in decarbonizing their economies and then start imposing 
uh, uh, carbon border adjustments, uh, duties on carbon intensive goods at the border, uh, you know, that might impose some cost on exporting developing countries, but you know, I think that's going to be good for the world and the climate as a whole, and would be something that I would support given the, the long-term benefits. Um, and I don't think it would be significant disadvantage from strategies of developing countries that are doing the right thing at home. Well, Danny, I want to thank you again for giving this presentation, and I wish we were in person uh, so that I could make the presentation to you. But uh, very insightful for our members that, that couldn't see the presentation for a time. Uh, it has been recorded and will be posted so that you can watch it in its entirety uh, at another time. Uh, again, uh, we appreciate this very, very timely and important topic and your great insights into the issues of globalization. And with that, I will end this session uh, of our virtual AAEA meetings. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Keith, and thank you everybody for uh, for listening. It was a, it was a great honor for me. Thank you.